for helping us get uh, put this together and patient working with me during these times and making this happen. So, so what we're going to do is what we decided to do is what, so Chris is a, a board uh, board member of the chamber. So he's going to keep the flow going and he'll ask, there'll be, there's a few questions that are out there that are all probably pretty simple and easy to go forward with. And uh, I'll hand it over to Chris. So anyway, welcome to everybody here from SAMA. Um, I think there's a few, or four or five or six of you. So um, anyway, if you're ever in Moose Jaw, stop by the chamber and say hi. So mm. I'll uh, take it away, Chris, and uh, looking forward to uh, uh, the outcome and the knowledge you're going to gather here. Well, thanks so much, Rob. So I'm Chris Rasmussen, board member for the Moose Jaw District Chamber of Commerce, and I have a background in media here in Moose Jaw. I've been covering the city of Moose Jaw for over 16 years, uh, left that position recently, and now I'm a job developer with the Canadian Council on Rehabilitation and Work. I, but I still try and keep my fingers on the pulse of the city and be involved in the board, so that's why I'm here today. So I wanted to welcome everybody to our presentation featuring the Saskatchewan Assessment Management Agency. In recent months, really in fact for a couple of years now, there's been a significant number of calls or emails into the Chamber of Commerce regarding the process for assessment and taxation, how things are calculated, how maybe some of the appeals process go forward. So in response, the chamber felt it would be very beneficial to bring everyone together in a presentation like this to discuss the ins and outs. So a little bit before we get underway, uh, if memory serves me correctly and, and my, my notes, the city of Moose Jaw entered into a contract with SAMA back in 2006 to provide assessment data for taxation purposes. Previously, the city of Moose Jaw had their own assessment team at City Hall until that contract was ratified, I believe in 2006. With us today are several members of the SAMA team, and I'd like to ask Nancy to introduce your team, if you could, please. Thanks, Chris. And you are correct on your history of uh, how assessment has shifted from the city uh, to being contracted out to SAMA. So um, I'm Nancy Walner. I'm the manager of the regional office here, and we have our other staff members here today. I'll introduce them shortly. Uh, our office is in Moose Jaw is, has six employees here, and there are seven other regional offices in SAMA uh, spread across the province. We also have a, a central office, and that, um, that houses a lot of our uh, experts and analysts, and we have a whole nother side of SAMA that we'll discuss a little bit further along, and uh, they do a governance side to SAMA. So we do assessments, but there's also a governance side for the province that we do. Now we have a, a slideshow presentation and Jason is going to share his screen and bring it up. Okay, I'll just actually ask you to hold off on that for a moment. Could you just introduce your team and then I'll, uh, I'll finish our introductions here. Oh, sure, sure. So we have Deloy Wires. He's an appraiser here. He's been in Moose Jaw since 1977, nearly his whole life. Uh, a lot of you may know him or have seen him around. We have Jason Forward. Uh, he's uh, new to Moose Jaw, but not new to Sama. And so you will get to know uh, Jason's face around town as well. We have Deb Vicentini, uh, born and raised in Moose Jaw. So some of you may recognize the face or you may recognize her. She's been uh, knocking on a lot of doors lately. She's been doing a lot of our residential reinspection this summer already. Uh, so Deb is uh, here with us. We also have Diane Thompson. Uh, she is SAMA's revaluation unit manager, and she brings 18 years of experience uh, to us. And in addition to her license here in Saskatchewan, uh, Diana also has her credentials with the Appraisal Institute of Canada and, and the International uh, Association of Assessing Officers, which I will shorten and call the IAAO. Also, we have Darwin Canius uh, on here. I, there he is. His camera is not on. Um, Darwin is uh, SAMA's Technical Standards and Policy Manager of Quality Control, and he brings 46 years of experience to the table for us. Also, he has credentials with the IAAO as well, and he has been involved with the IAAO since 2009. Um, Darwin, uh, if, if you may have, some of you may recognize the name, he worked, he and I both worked with the city of Moose Jaw, prior to it being contracted out to SAMA. So him and I have been around a long time. 
longer than that map uh, on the back of the wall there. <laughs> so, uh, and me, myself, I'm Nancy Walner. I'm the manager of the office here. And I've worked in assessment since 1996. And for anyone that has been around that long um, and remembers the name Dave Pierce or David Pierce, Butch was his nickname. He hired me back in 1996. He also hired Di Darwin Canius. So uh, we go back a little way. We have a, little, a lot of history uh, of when it was the city as well. I'm also on the board of directors of the Saskatchewan Association of Assessing Officers, which we shorten and call the SAAA, and also on the professional development committee of the international organization, the IAAO. And I also have my credentials with the IAAO as well. So, um, so as members of the national, the provincial, national, and international, we are bound by uh, a code of ethics. They each have their own code of ethics that we are bound by as well. And I'd just like to mention too that um, uh, we're licensed here in the province of Saskatchewan. Uh, the SAAA is legislated through the Assessment Management Agency Act, that part of the legislation. And we also meet the standards as set out in the Assessment Appraisers Act. Uh, so we're certified or licensed, and that includes both education and experience. So what we do, we're bound by a lot of legislation and a lot of regulation, and um, that's how we, we uh, work with the assessment field. Excellent. Thanks, thanks very much, Nancy, for doing those introductions. You're welcome. So we, we only have the hour here today, so it's a very complicated process depending on how deep that you want to get. So I'd like to get into things very quickly here. Uh, the SAMA team has their presentation together and they're going to discuss a number of different things, including who they are and what they do, the purpose of assessments and how it's used for taxation, market value standards will be discussed, as well as the 2021 reevaluation. And that often gets us a little all tightened up because what's going to happen with the process and is it going to be what we expect it to be or did something else come into the mix? So I can't wait to see what some of that information will be today. Uh, I will ask everybody on the call today to keep an eye on that clock because we only have until the 12 o'clock hour. So we want to make sure that we get through the presentation and all of the questions as well. If you do have a question for the SAMA team, please use the chat function in Zoom. We'll collect them. And if there's time at the end, we'll get to the questions as best we can. If we don't get to your question, we'll submit it to the SAMA team and hopefully get the response back and send it out to the members as we can. So, Nancy, with that, please take it away with your presentation. And again, if anybody has any questions, use that chat function. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. So, um, we'll just move through to the overview slide. I think it's the this one. So, as Chris, as you mentioned, these are all the points that we're going to hit on today, uh, including the appeal process and uh, the, the confidentiality of the market data that we collect is, is two more that would be added to the list that you had. Um, the next slide. So we talked a little bit about who we are and about our licensing that we have with through the province. Um, and we've already done the introduction, so let's talk about what we do, which is the next slide. So SAMA is a government agency who has two broad roles, governance and assessment services, as you can see here. So SAMA is charged by the province to establish and maintain all the assessment rules and all the policies that must be followed by all assessors in the province of Saskatchewan. And that includes producing handbooks and guides as well. Our governance role is also includes administering the provincial quality assurance, which includes role balancing. And that's something that the, the municipalities submit to the province with all of their valuations at, at the end of the year. And primary audits, which is also another legislated rule and what we have to follow as well. SAM is also charged with maintaining a, a province-wide a, a, a CAMA system, a computer-aided mass appraisal system that, that holds and maintains all the information of all the properties in the province, at least the ones that we have uh, we are assessing over. So SAM's second major area of responsibility is assessment services, and that's what we do here specifically in the region. Um, and we do all, SAMA does all but four municipalities in the province. And that's the city of Saskatoon, city of Regina, city of PA, and city of Swift Current. They all do their own assessment function. So we don't do that all here in Moostra. We only do the city of Moostra, but 
with between all our other seven uh, regional offices, all of them are, are handled by SAMA. So our assessment service division, we have 151 staff in SAMA, 110 of them are devoted specifically to the assessment services side. And the remaining would be um, attributed to the governance side. So we deter determine the assessments based on law in Saskatchewan for municipal assessment purposes. So our assessments are not intended to be used for any other uh, purposes such as financing or if you're going to list your house today uh, because our values are historical values as we'll, we'll discuss later on. So and just as a little note um, for anybody that's dealt with out of province, Saskatchewan has different assessment legislation different from anybody else, any other jurisdiction in Canada. So we are unique here in Saskatchewan. So uh, a lot of our rules and governance are different. So if you if you come from out of province or you have experience in other province, um, Saskatchewan is different. Uh, the next slide. So the purpose of assessments, and I'm just going to touch on this briefly because SAMA does not is not involved with the taxation side. So uh, ad valorem taxation is a method of uh, property taxation based on value, which is the same approach. That part is the same for all of North America. So property taxation is the main source of revenue for municipalities to help provide for those services um, that the taxpayers want and need. So, and just to be clear, taxation is the sole responsibility of the municipality. Mill rates, mill rate factors, all determined by the municipality. So what SAMA does is we provide the assessment valuations to the city and they use that as their basis for taxation. The province has a role in it as well because the province is responsible for setting the provincial percentages of value. So for example, um, residential is taxed at 80% and they also, the province also sets the education mill rates. There's an explanation of all of that which comes on your notice of assessment and taxation notice that you'll get from the city. Next slide. 2021 revaluation. A revaluation is a four, four years in duration. So that's legislated through the province. Um, so what we do is we update uh, to a current base date every revaluation and we look at the market conditions every four years. So we look at the information on your property and we update it with what's happening in the market. So the base date is a legislated thing. So our, our assessments are a historical view because the assessment notices that you're going to get for 2021, which were mailed yesterday, uh, are based on January 1st of 2019. So we looked at four years of sales ending January 1st of 2019 and we looked at what the market was telling us and we are reporting those valuations out now. So it's a historical view. So even today, when you get your assessment notice, understand that that's already a, a two, year, two years ago valuation, okay? So what we do is we value those properties as if they existed on January 1st of 2019. So it's for, for your 2021 assessment notice, that's based on the facts, conditions, and circumstances affecting your property as of January 1st of 2021. So we look at your property on the facts and conditions of January 1st of 21, but we value it based on January 1st of 2019. So even a newly built property that's newly built, 2020 build, 2021 build, we're looking at what the facts, the physical part of it, the facts and the circumstances of it were as of January 1st of this year, but we're using the market data, four years of market data that ended on January 1st of 2019 to value it. So, um, so for the current assessment, that four years, we used uh, 2015 data, 2016 data, 2017 and 2018 data. So sales occurring after January 1st of 2019, after that base date, they will be used in the next valuation cycle, okay? So just remember what we are doing is just interpreting what's happening in the market uh, with the more uh, market data that is sent to us, um, those mailers that we send out or the more sales that occur, the better and the more accurate the modeling is. And, and we'll get into that a little bit later in our presentation, Diane will go through that for us. 
So we're just interpreting how the market is reacting and providing the city with an est and, and ultimately you, the rate payers, um, an, an estimate of value. So the work for the 2025 revaluation is well underway and its base date will be January 1st of 2023. So revaluations are every four years. So the base date is every four years and then we roll out those values two years after that base date. Okay, so next slide. So assessment notices throughout the cycle. So the city of Moose Jaw will send every property an assessment notice in the first year of the revaluation cycle. Uh, the subsequent three years of the cycle, a property will only get a notice unless there has been a change to the property. And that change can be one of three things, typically. Uh, a physical change, so you took out a building permit or demo permit, something's changed on the property. Uh, a owner has changed. So if the owner's changed, that new owner would get a notice for that property. And sometimes SAMA changes a model, uh, which would change valuations as well. And a lot of times that occurs through um, the appeal process. It can occur through the appeal process. So that's typically the main three ways um, that a property would get, a, that would trigger a property to get a assessment notice in the subsequent three years of the revaluation cycle. So with revaluations um, come assessment changes and shifts, and we'll talk about that later in the presentation, that are different among uh, the different classes of properties. So different classes of properties can have different, um, can increase at different levels, and we'll, we'll look at that. So what we do, you're probably wondering, the base date's January 1st of 2019, so we have four years of data, but we don't we don't roll that out till two years later. So that two year lag is needed for us to look at, analyze that data. We make a lot of phone calls back to you, property owners. And then what we'd have to do is we have to supply that information to the provincial government. Uh, typically for the 2021 year, we provided it last April. And as I alluded to earlier, the, the province looks at that and they set uh, the provincial percentages of value with those numbers. And those preliminary numbers also go to the city, but those don't go to the city until this year, it went to the city, I believe, January, February of 2021. So the city doesn't have a lot of lead time before they send out the notices to the property owners. Um, let me just see. Uh, next slide, please. So these are some of the provincial trends that we were seeing across the province. And if you can see a residential across the province, this is all the, the property uh, assessment service providers, including the cities of Regina, Saskatoon, Prince Albert and Swift Current are included in this, this graph here. So you'll see across the province, residential on average is going down 7%. Seasonal properties, that's your lake properties, they're, they're not really changing much. They're staying about the same. Multifamily properties uh, are going down about 3%. Arable properties are going up 25%. The non-arable properties, like your pasture land, they're going up 21%. Commercial properties, which is probably of most interest here, on average across the province, it's 12%. Pipeline railway, 17%. Elevator, 17%. So a total, overall total, uh, we're looking at about a 7% increase across the province. So trends are based on provincial assessment service providers for everybody. And remember, this is as of the base date of January 1st to 2019. So today we're seeing, for example, a very buoyant residential market, uh, obviously a very uh, seller's market. Those aren't included in this because if we recall, 20, 2019, 2020, 2021 will be used for our next revaluation cycle, okay? So when you look at residential and you say, oh, it's going down 7%, but it's a seller's market, things are going crazy, that will be that'll be reflected in the next cycle. Uh, next slide. Uh, this slide I'll ask uh, Darwin Canius if he would like to um, go through the next couple slides for us. Oh. Excuse me. Good morning, everybody. I'd be happy to. I'm sorry, I don't have a camera working. It hasn't been working for the last several days. So 
another technical glitch they'll have to deal with in the future. But that being said, I think uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. And mm -hmm. we'll get into a little bit of the details here on the um, on the assessment side. So we have two standards that uh, all of us have to meet in the province. We have the regulated property standard and the non-regulated. Uh, the regulated is uh, properties that are basically a force of law valuation uh, that are included in the manuals that we have. And they are basically the properties that uh, wouldn't be overly uh, popular in the Moose Jaw. They don't have a lot of that in the, t uh, in the city. The only property I would think of that would probably fall under this would be the asphalt plant in the south on the southeast there uh, but th for the most part a lot of the regulated properties you'd be familiar with would be the potash mines and the uh, stuff in between Regina and Saskatoon the big industrial properties there those would be more the regulated property assessments the high value properties that really don't transact in the marketplace um, at all or very often what we'd be familiar with and what you'd be familiar with and concerned with here is the non-regulated. That's all the property we'd be familiar with, like our homes, residential, our houses, our condos, our apartments, our commercial properties such as warehouses, all your restaurants, retails, offices, the mall, hotels, all the properties here that you have that you're typically, um, uh, you know, you know, either occupying, leasing out, or um, owning uh, outright. So we deal with that uh, particularly. Um, and we have to assess those properties under certain rules and conditions, and we relate it directly back to the market activity. I think Nancy mentioned that earlier this morning about how we use sales, but we also use other uh, pieces of data, which you may be familiar with since you've been very helpful in the past you know, you know, couple of cycles, assisting us with this process by sending us those uh, returns when we ask you for your um, your rental information, your expenses, and those kinds of information we use to modeling. So that's what um, is included in how we value the non-regulated properties. Now, what we do also have is a series of other principles that we have to meet. And Nancy mentioned earlier that some of us are members of other organizations, uh, such as the Appraisal Institute of Canada, the AIC, and the IAAO. All these organizations deal with valuation and they deal with it in a different way. The Appraisal Institute of Canada deal with it on a more uh, precise single property valuation and their purpose of valuation is a lot different than ours. But the principles are very similar. We have to deal with uh, what we call mass appraisal. We have to value the universe of properties. We have to value tens of thousands of properties, hundreds of thousands of properties in the province, I believe. I think our property count throughout the province is about 850,000 know, uh, accounts that we deal with in the province. I think Moosha has about 15,000 accounts if I'm not, if, if I'm you know, pretty you know, accurate on that, pretty close, I, I would think, in my experience with Moosha. But a mass appraisal re really means the process of preparing assessments for groups of property as of the base date. We talked about that a lot. Using standard appraisal methods, employing common data, and allowing for statistical testing. And that's one of the key things that is different from what we do than perhaps what a single property appraiser would do. We have um, sophisticated software that we can um, model um, hundreds of sales uh, and thousands of data points and that'll help us develop our models to replicate the market. Um, so that's how we uh, uh, deal with that. That's what the mass appraisal definition is. Market value, uh, our market value definition is virtually identical to uh, the definition in the, in the single property appraisal world. It means the amount, of, uh, amount that a property should be expected to realize if the real estate in fee simple in the property is sold in a competitive and open market by a willing seller to a willing buyer, each acting prudently and knowledgeably and assuming that the amount is not affected by undue stimuli. Now that's in a perfect world, right? And we know the markets are imperfect and uh, we try to do our modeling uh, and interpret this data, not just the sales. And we have, uh, again, again, we're only, you know, we're only as good as the data that we have at our disposal. Uh, but with your help, um, the, you know, the property owners that um, rent property, uh, that buy and sell property, you are part of this, um, process and uh, we appreciate your cooperation and help when we ask for this information and we'll talk about a little, that a little bit later and how important it is and how um, uh, we take it seriously and, and to protect that data um, that you provide us. So um, 
we'll go on here. Uh, what we don't do um, is we don't value your personal property. We exclude that information or that uh, amount if it's provided to us from the valuation process. So really we're charged with valuing just the real estate, the land and the buildings, the improvements. Um, and we have different techniques to do that. So um, that in the nutshell is basically uh, those two regulations um, and there's rules and regulations and, uh, and process involved that, add, that goes into the, um, the details. We can get into that a little bit later. I think we can move on, Nancy. Again, I guess that's me again on the next slide. Thank you. Um, the, um, on the non-regulated side, we have three accepted approaches to value. And for anybody who uh, has owned property, um, you own your home, you own your business, I suspect that you've had appraisals done and you've had some sort of idea on what your property is worth. So um, just like a property appraiser would do, we use and we apply these three standard approaches to value, the cost approach, the sales comparison approach, and the property income or the rental approach. Really quickly, the cost approach really is valuing the land separately from the buildings. And we have cost manuals to cost the buildings out. The appraisers go out in the field and gather the physical data of the properties, the size, the height, the type of property, the age of the property, condition of the property, those kinds of characteristics. And we have manuals that, uh, that help us um, you know, value this property. We have a very sophisticated uh, uh, computerized system that um, helps us uh, um, uh, determine these values. And what we do is when we get the cost values, we also measure them against sales prices or sales values that, um, that occur locally in Moose John. I believe we had in this last cycle, we had a four year cycle, we had you know, close to 60 or 70 sales that we use of, um, of various kinds of the commercial kinds. We had several uh, apartments sell, we had a hotel sell and uh, several commercial property sale. And we analyze those sales and adjust the costs accordingly based on the groupings of properties to get um, a, 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 an estimated value based on the cost approach. The sales comparison approach is typically used for your residential properties. When you receive your notice um, in the next day or so, uh, if you haven't received it already, the sales comparison approach is used uh, for residential, your home. Um, that's a common technique that's used by the, the real estate industry and the appraisers, they compare your property to a select a few properties in the neighborhood. What we do is we have as many as 2000 sales over that four year period that we uh, put into a, a statistical software package and, and, analyze, the, uh, and analyze the data. And uh, you know, a value is determined based on how, you, how your home compares to several other homes um, uh, based on uh, the uh, characteristics of your homes, whether it has basement finish, detached garage, a deck, fireplaces, your location, whether you're across from a park, backing onto an apartment or a busy street, all those um, data points are analyzed and um, uh, adjustments are made to, uh, to, to your property based on the, the analysis of those sales with those data characteristics. So. While your assessment may not be actual value, it's pretty close to value. And like Nancy said earlier, we're about a two year lag time behind. And if I was to look at my assessment, when I see it, I know it's gonna be lower than what probably it'd be worth today based on the activity today. Um, so that being said, what you can do is you compare it to your neighbors and to see how your assessment relates to your neighbors that can give you an idea uh, if you're being treated fairly or equitably. The property income and rental approach, that's what we're going to be using. And you know, that's what we've used in Moose Jaw for the last couple of cycles now. And that's basically um, the property's ability to generate income as it's a rented property. And if, you, if the audience here um, owns property themselves, we would apply the model to, that, to your property as well, because you're in direct competition with these properties that are also rented out. If you uh, own property that you rent out uh, to, um, to a third party for their purposes, and the, the data that we receive from you on what, you, uh, what, what that rental rate is, your expenses and that, that's analyzed by our appraisers, our analysts, 
to determine the typical uh, rent rates. And we consider things like vacancy, your expenses. And just like, a real, just like an appraiser does, we would have to compute what we would call a net operating income at the end. And then we compare that to the sales prices to, to, to derive an assessment, very similar to, the, uh, to an appraiser. But again, we do it on a very large scale. And finally, we have to value and we're required to value all properties. Our legislation doesn't permit us to uh, exclude a property just because it's not being used, just because it's vacant or run down. There has to be some type of value on there. And uh, of course, appraisers will be looking at that closely um, and relative to its condition. So uh, those are the kinds of things we would look at on these approaches to value. Thank you, Darwin. And, and just to emphasize, um again, that we're not looking at your business income. We don't care how many shoes you sell, how many pizzas you sell, how many patients you see. It's not, we don't look at your business income. And I think next we'll have Diane Thompson uh, give us a little bit more information on that uh, in the coming slides. Thank you. I think Darwin already touched on what our income approach is all about. It's, uh, to value the property as it relates to the rental income that it could generate or does generate. So it is associated with uh, rental of the building or the space. In some cases, buildings are broken up into several uh, units. So we look at each one. So we collected all the, we sent out these income and expense information forms for the last four years from 2015 to 2018 to the property owners to collect their rental information, rental and expense information. And we were used that based on typical conditions of your property to develop the uh, rental uh, rates that we are going to apply as well as vacancies and expenses. Now, when I say expenses, um, we do actually take it to an, a net operating income, which means your expenses are subtracted from your potential income in order to get a net rent rate. So that's part of our process, something that we actually have to uh, go through. So once we do all of this and we have your, uh, we have your, you see your value, you've got to remember when you're looking at it, even if you sent us in your information that we're not going to use your actual expenses and rental information because that all go, kind of goes into the big pot and we come out with what we consider typical. So you're going to get, you're going to be compared to your neighbors. You're going to be compared to your other properties that are, similar to yours in order for us to determine what rent rate is typical of your property type. So then we actually get, so when we're doing this type of valuation, we have an NOI that we use to develop the cap rate on the sale. So we take the modeled rent rates and the mo modeled vacancy rates and we apply them to the sales to develop the capitalization rate. With, and a cap rate expresses, expresses the relationship between the property's net operating income stream and its sale price. So a cap rate for commercial property is calculated for each sale. And then we do a, our, our analysis, we divide them into different you have your different categories of property. Like we talked earlier, we had restaurants, we have uh, office buildings, we have retail spaces. So we look at them in that respect too, that like we want to compare you to the same property type and come up with a, what we call a median cap rate for a, a property type or a group of properties that we are valuing. Now a median, is the middle. It's not, it's not like the average, which is where you throw them all in the pot and average them out. This is a median is the middle number. So if you have an array of 
30 sales in a particular group, we're going to pick the middle one. We're not going to pick the high one and we're not going to pick the low one. It's usually in the middle. So, um, and I, I'll just mention that fee appraisers kind of, they kind of do the same thing, but fee appraisers are very selective in what they choose for their, for their uh, comparables. They don't need, we have to use everything. The appraisers can pick and choose what they use to value your property. So at the end of the day, it might not be the same. And again, the appraisers usually are doing a, an appraisal for you as of today, not two years ago, like we're doing. So, okay. So we actually, to do our rent model, we, because we're a little bit lacking in experienced staff when it comes to using our statistical uh, expertise and our sophisticated programs that we use, we actually engaged an internationally recognized expert in mass appraisal, Mr. Robert Glutemans, who has done this for 40 years and also written several textbooks on the subject of mass appraisal um, and developed, so what he did for us is he developed our general commercial rent model and our multifamily rent model. That, that was what we uh, engaged him to do. We did the capitalization model ourselves after we had this rent model that Mr. Glutemans did for us. So the rent model or the models, pardon me, are applied to properties, whether you own them or lease them. So if, if, if you operate a business out of the property and you're not renting it out, that's, that's fine. Or if you lease it out, you're all treated the same. You're in direct competition with each other, so we treat you all the same. Um, and again, like I mentioned, your actual income and expenses might not be the same as the model because we are doing mass appraisal here. We're not doing individual appraisals on these properties. So, and I think Nancy mentioned we have 900 commercial properties to value. So the more data we get, the better, and the more representative it would be of all those property types. Let's pop to the next screen. Okay, so as I mentioned, we divide them into a number of different classes or categories for to look at. We have um, we have retail, we have restaurants, warehouse, and office in the in the general commercial category. We have apartments, which include all different types. So you have low rises, high rises, townhouses, row houses. You have your accommodation, which is your hotels and motels, and of course the shopping centers, both regional and um, the big mall that you have in Moose Jaw. So just what we're trying to impress here is that property valuation models express the forces of supply and demand in the local community or the local market to predict your market value. So we use the market whatever's going on in the market is what we're trying to reflect and replicate. So your potential income, just I'll carry on a little bit more about that. Your potential income is affected by the age of your building, like the year that it was built, the quality and condition of it, the size of it, the land to building ratio. In other words, how much of the land is being occupied by that building? Is it a large amount or a small amount? The location, is it located on a main thoroughfare, a busy, a busy street, or is it downtown, or is it kind of out away from everything? Um, and of course, the, the market conditions at the time when we do this includes your vacancy. So what is the demand at the time for these rental spaces? So your vacancy is very important as well. And we do our vacancy kind of as a, a, a one shot, one time a year 
sort of thing. It's very difficult to analyze individual vacancies. So we kind of, we do a, we do a drive around and, and check on all the buildings and try and have it as a point in time, which in the most part does reflect uh, what is going on. So um, maybe we'll just move on to the next screen, if you don't mind. So here's the types of things that we are going to want to collect from you. We need market data. So when we send out the income and expense returns, we're looking for your leasable areas, whatever rents you have in place, uh, vacancy rates. I mean, if you want to report a vacancy rate, we're more than happy to, to uh, know what that is. Whatever your collection losses are, any other income that, have, that is attributable to the property, not your business. Just remember that. We don't, we don't care what you, how many shoes you sell. So if your property is owner occupied, don't forget, Nancy mentioned that you will get a mail out. We send them to everybody once every four years, just because we want to check up and see if anything has changed because we're not necessarily keeping up every single time to make sure that you're still owner occupying that property. We, we're going to check on it if there's a sale, obviously, but if you're still owner occupied, we pretty much just leave you alone and just get you to confirm that every four years and then we're good. So can we look at the next screen? I'm just, because we're talking about, okay. So those were the types of things we want for income. And then we have expenses that we, uh, you may or may not, um, have these expenses uh, to report because some properties charge their tenants uh, just a, um, a rent rate and then the expenses are picked up by the lease, by the leaser. They have to pay their, pay for the power and the uh, certain amounts to pay the tax, pay certain things that the, the owners don't pay, but if the owner is paying these things, it becomes part of a, we have to remove the, let's put it this way, we have to remove those expenses from your income so that you're the same as the guy that's, uh, that's not actually paying it, but his tenant is paying it. So that's how we get to what we call an NOI, which is your net operating income, which is all your income minus your expenses. So, as I said, we send out these forms every single year to the properties that are that we know or we we hope we know are rental properties. And we hope that the more information that you send us in, the more information we have and the more accurate our models will be. So please send it to us. And if for some reason um you get missed, give us a call. We, we're more than happy to uh, supply you with the forms. So we have sent out the 20, for this cycle that we're moving into now, which we won't see any new values for until 2025, but we're in the process right now of collecting the data that we will use. And we have sent out the 2019, we did that a year ago. And pretty quick, Starting probably next week, we will be sending out the forms for 2020 information. So please help us out if you can. Um, I, uh, the legislation actually in this province requires that you do that. And they can actually, they actually have some penalties mandated if you fail to do so. So, I mean, we're, we just want the information. So we, we ask and we, we just ask that you please comply because the more we get, the better it is and the better it is for you. Okay, do you wanna go on, down one more? Yeah, I'll, I, can, I can take it from here, Diane. Thank you. 
very much. Um, so there is two types of market data, what Diane was alluding to, where we're asking and collecting your income and expense information. The other type of market data that we have is property sales. So uh, if you've sold a property, you will get a form out from us, uh, a sales verification form that we ask you to fill in. Um, on commercial properties, please expect a phone call from us. We'll be phoning you to verify more information, collect more information. We'll be inspecting that property. Every property that's sold will come out and inspect. We will also ask if you've had an appraisal done on that property, and we would ask if you shared it with us. Um, that helps us in our process of valuation. Uh, we also, we cannot and we do not consider listings or sales after the base date those will be considered for the next revaluation. And if it's just a listing, um, that doesn't help us. It, it's not solid market data because it needs to be sold. So next, um, so some of the things we'll ask for, and I'll just go through this really quickly. I think we're running out of time. There's provisions in the legislation, as Diane had said, to ask for this information. Um, so we ask for physical information pertaining to structures, property transfer, sales, income and expense data. Uh, and as Diane alluded to, uh, the legislation provides uh, for penalties, which you know we don't wanna go there, but probably more important uh, to take notice of is if you don't provide us the information we ask for, you can lose your right to appeal your property. So uh, it's, that's a really big thing. Um, if, you, if we're mailing you stuff and you're not returning it and you get your valuation and you think, you know, I wanna appeal this, uh, there is legislation that the board can take into consideration and dismiss your appeal if you haven't provided it. So it's really important. And really when you're providing us the information, you're helping us help you. Cause uh, like, as Diane said, the more information we have, the more accurate we'll have your valuation to what the market is saying. Um, so we just encourage you. And like, again, as Diane said, this cycle, we had a higher, even higher than last cycle return rate. So kudos to you and thank you very much for uh, continuing to help us make our valuations better. Uh, next slide. Also, I know in the past and even to this day, we have people that are concerned that if they fill out those forms, that has that information on that's really confidential. They don't want their competitors to see it or know about it. Um, we do keep that confidential and it's in the legislation for us to keep it confidential. Uh, so SAMA does not release any property specific income and expense information it's collected unless it's ordered through an appeal board or through the court. And even if it is, we would mask that information so as to not to identify the property. Um, that's part of what we do. And SAMA has been successful um, in the past at keeping that uh, information confidential when we were challenged by the court. So we want to provide you with some level of, of confidence there. So we collect the information uh, to understand and report what's happening in the market. Again, not to give out to your competitors. The next slide. Um, again, I'll try to go through this quick. Uh, the appeal process. So each year the city of Musha will open the roll, it's called. And it's almost, uh, I think the word roll came from the ledger when it used to be an old ledger format that you could come in and flip through and look at yours and all your neighbors' properties is where the term comes from. So the roll opened yesterday when the assessment notices um, went out and it closes, it'll close 60 days from then. I'm sorry, I don't have the date in front of me today. So in a reval year, you're given 60 days in which to appeal your property. So 60 days from when you get your notice, you can appeal that property. Um, in the other three years, you only get 30 days. So what we do is we invite you uh, to come in and discuss that with us. You can come in and talk to us for free. We're really good at going through the details of your property. And if there's an error on there, we will work with you to get that corrected. And oftentimes uh, that can be done through an agreement to adjust. You don't have to go through the whole board of revision procedure. So it's a little bit simpler process. So again, um, we invite you to come and, and talk to us. Uh, our role is open and uh, advertised. You can find it. This is, I got from the city. They put it in the local paper on the Moose Jaw, uh, on their website and on Discover Moose Jaw. And there's quickly, there's three levels of appeal. The local level, which is um, where you get it and you appeal. 
after that level, there's a provincial level. And after that, there's a court of appeal level. And there's only certain ways and certain times that you can uh, appeal to the second and third level. Uh, next slide. So where are we located? We're actually located on the fourth floor of City Hall. We lease this space from the city. Uh, right now uh, with the COVID, we are closed to the public. Um, when that changes, we'll let the city know and we'll probably have that posted on our website. But for now, we are close to the public. So phone us at the number here, uh, email us at the email address that you can see on the screen. We have a website. Um, the Sound of You website has the profiles and property information of all the properties on the city. So if you wanna look at your neighbors or other properties, you can go through there. Uh, you have to set up an account, uh, which is normal these days. If you're going in to, to search anything, you have to set up an account. And there's how-to videos and tutorials on there if you're not sure of how to go through it. Um, that'll all be posted. It's all posted on there too. So we wanna encourage you, the city sent them out yesterday, talking to us is free, call us if you have any concerns um, and we wanna work with you. And if there's errors, let's get them fixed. And with that- Thanks so much for your time today, Nancy. We, we do need to move on to the questions section here. Uh, we have had several that have come in. Uh, the first one is, can, can you go over quickly the different be difference between assessment and appraisal? It was touched on a little bit, but would you mind expanding on the difference between assessment and an appraisal. Okay, oh, I see some, someone's answer. So the single property appraisal is the value of a property as of the date that they're asking for it. Uh, I'll just use a, a residential as a, a easy example. If you're going to buy a house today, you would likely get an a, appraisal done on it. Or if you're going to sell a house today, you'd get an appraisal. What that fee appraiser would do is they would look at a few sales in and around that are similar to that property and the closest to the date that they're doing that appraisal. Uh, as Darwin alluded to earlier, we're looking retrospectively at four years of sales and we're doing it on large, bigger groups. So that would be the main difference between our assessment of, uh, appraisals and a fee appraisal. You spoke about it, Nancy, uh, how important it is for businesses, especially to get those surveys back how does that impact your process if you don't get a good a, a good basis back for your assessments right so if we don't have a, a lot of detailed information we still according to the law we have to value it with what we have so if you can imagine for your commercial properties if we only had 20 percent for example which we have a much higher return rate than that but say we only had 20 percent return rate we would be valuing all the properties on only that information that came in. So there'd be a lot of gaps there and um, we, we would have to do our best with what we have. If we had a 100% return rate, we'd have every property owner returning that. Our, our, our valuations would be as close to exact as possible. So you can just see the variations on, on depending on the information. And I don't know, I see Diane has her camera and I don't know if she wanted to add to that but that would be the difference um, in the accuracies. Would having a better basis of information help maybe alleviate some of the concern in the business community right now with the assessment process and the appeals that are going on if you had that 100% base? Well, I'm not sure what the concerns are out there right now. Okay. So I, I can't really speak to that. But um, obviously if we're valuing off the market data and we have market data on every property, it would, it would, the accuracy would be pretty high. If we only have information on 20%, for example, the accuracy would be less high. But according to the legislation, and as I said, Saskatchewan is unique, we have to value what we have. So um, that's why we need your help to help you get, you know, the best uh, valuations and most accurate that we can. So I'll maybe expand on that a little bit about some of the concerns in the community. Um, since SAMA took over in 2006, at least anecdotally, there appears to be an increase in the number of appeals that are coming through and that's impacting the taxation process and the budgeting process for the city of Moose Jaw. Is, is there any background, is there any insight from the SAMA point of view of why there appears to be an increase in appeals in the city of Moose Jaw? 
Uh, I don't have the numbers. Um, Darwin Canius, who's on here, he he and I worked with the city, so we were uh, we we saw the peels prior to 2006. I'm not sure if, uh, that that I would agree with that. There has been a significant okay. increase. 2017, we did see an increase in appeals. Um, and that would have been where a lot of, uh, there was a lot more in the news about it in 2017. Um, what I can report back is that um, even though there was a lot of appeals, going through the appeal process, through the boards of revision, through the provincial board, and even we, the ones that have been decided at the court of appeal, uh, Salmon's valuations have been upheld in 95% of the cases. So um, I, I don't know what is uh, creating those appeals, but what I can say, and, and, and with pride and for the cities, uh, we are trying to provide that stability. Um, and, and the courts uh, have said that our values are, are what they are and they've upheld them. So in the end, we have stability, but yes, uh, definitely through the appeal process, there can be ups and downs. The, the local board can decide one way, the provincial board can then reverse it. And that's what happened in a lot of the cases uh, for the city of Moose Jaw. In my research as a reporter, and then again, preparing for the presentation today, I understand there are some firms out there that make a living appealing assessments. And so what challenges come from that? Because I, I understand they're making this on a, on a percentage basis. If a, a business can get an appeal awarded to them, they get a cut from it. So it's clearly a, a business model that they're working from. But how is SAMA working to address this and allow for maybe better budget planning for the city of Moose Jaw? Because there have been some years where there's been a, a fairly large award to some of the applicants. Well, again, um, uh, I don't recall large awards in this last cycle, if we, if we can stick to that, because I'm most sure. familiar with that uh, in recent memory, um, there has been uh, some appeals that at the, like I said, at the, the municipal level have not went our way, but in 95% of the cases at the provincial level and at the court of appeal level have upheld their values. So um, how do you provide stability for the city? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know how to answer that when, when the courts are saying our values are accurate. So, and the legislation um, allows for agents to, to be part of the appeal process. And if uh, a property owner wants to have an agent, that's fine. Um, we do have an authorization form that we get them to fill in so that we know that they're representing a property owner. Because as we had talked about, we get the information and provide it, uh, keep it confidential. So uh, we want to make sure if someone's coming forward and saying they're representing a property owner, we just want to make sure that we have that authorization uh, from that. In the past, we have had appeals put in on behalf of agents. Uh, that withdraw them later because they uh, appealed on behalf of a property owner but didn't have that authorization. So that's really important to us and, and we do take it seriously keeping that information confidential. So um, it's an extra step, but it's, it's an important one to, to make sure that we're safeguarding the information that everyone's sending in and that we're really grateful for people to send in. We, we had a question in the chat box here and uh, I might be able to answer it. Um, SAMA doesn't need to justify the fact that the values are based on 2019 because that is the legislation as I understand it. You can't base your assessments on 2021 and COVID because the legislation states you have certain benchmark dates. So I hope that maybe answers the question that's in the chat box, but it actually leads into a question that I have. Are you planning on getting a lot of questions because of how things were in 2019 compared to how they are now after more than 12 months of COVID, because I'm going to guess there's some discrepancies there. So do you have a plan in place to address that? I guess uh, what we'll do is as people phone in, uh, we'll have to make sure to, that people understand. And that's one of the reasons we reached out to the chamber um, because we want people to have that information and really understand the base date, that, that, um, that concept of the base date. So it's two years old already. By the end of this four year cycle, the data, it's actually five years 
in the past, right? So um, this year, 2020 with COVID and this year with COVID, that'll be stuff that we analyze uh, for our next revaluation cycle in 20, with the base date of 2023. So we do have information on our website about that already. We are reaching out to the uh, chamber and we are really wanting people to, to call us and, and to talk about their property. And um, like I said, we really wanna be available and for anybody that calls in to explain whatever questions they have. We'll wrap up the presentation here with a, a final question. Um, if a business truly believes there's been an error in their assessment or a miscalculation, how should they go about the easiest way to, to start that appeal process? Or maybe even just ask you an honest question. Hey, maybe this address is wrong or something like that. Yep. The simple to the complicated. Um, we, if we go we'll look at the slide, oh, the slide's off the screen now, but our phone number was on there, our email address is on there. What we do, and actually in legislation, if you read the form that you'd fill out an appeal form, it actually asks if you've talked to an appraiser first. You're, you're supposed to talk to us first before filing an appeal, and we want you to. Oftentimes we can alleviate uh, any concerns, we can explain things through, and I mean, we have other appraisers on the line here from SAMA, but Oftentimes, once they talk, we talk to them, explain that base date, we explain the information, they go, they might not like it, but they understand it. And that's, you know, that's the way it is. And a lot of times through talking with them, we go through their physical property, making sure we have everything. Um, there, there could be an error. There could be something that's no longer there that we didn't know about. Because uh, we get our information through permits a lot of the time. So if... Um, yeah, there it is. So we get our information a lot of the time through the permitting through the city. The city actually supplies us with lists of what to do and go out and see. So if, if things are done without a permit or um, uh, whatever reason we're not, the city isn't setting us out there, then um, we wouldn't, we may not know about it. We also have a reinspection program that we're committed to getting through all the properties in 12 years. So we will try to catch it then. But, you know, that doesn't help if they're phoning us today and we're not getting out to their property for a couple of years, right? So, yeah, call us. Uh, let's figure it out. If we have an error, we'll work to correct it. Um, it's, it's sometimes where we don't see, agree that there's an error um, between talking to the, the property owner and explaining things. Um, they just don't see that it being right then there might just be that discrepancy and definitely go through the appeal process. And that's when we let a board of revision uh, or one of the three levels of appeals decide that then. Well, thank you very much, Nancy, Diane and Darwin for joining us here today. Thank you for taking our questions. I know some had a little bit of salt in them, but we do appreciate your honest answers. Uh, if anybody on the call today has any questions, Sama again, located in the fourth floor of Moose Jaw City Hall, closed right now due to COVID. So please call in advance 306-694-4425. You can also go to their website, sama.sk.ca and make sure that you start at the local level first and then work your way through the process. If you try to circumvent that process, there will be hiccups along the way, causing more problems for an already complicated process. So <laughs> please make sure that you're following through those steps. Rob, do you have anything else to add? No, just wanted to thank everybody there and uh, good process here. I'm glad I picked up something. That what I picked up is if there is phone calls, emails, or questions on the street, uh, I know where to go to now, 4425 or sama.sk. So we can, we can send them in that direction. And that's a, that's a great opportunity for businesses that have questions. So anyway, thanks to everybody. Thanks to Sama. The thing I learned here, I didn't realize there's that many people in Moose Jaw that work with Sam. I thought it was just Nancy. So <laughs> quite, a, quite an education for me up here at, uh, at, at the chamber office. So appreciate that as well. All the best to everybody. Um, and uh, and we'll, uh, we'll hopefully run across you some very soon. Thank you very much again. It was, it was our pleasure to be here. Yeah, thanks. Thank thanks you very so much, much, everyone. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thanks. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thank you.